Shall we get started? Judging by the number of people I thought it was earlier, but it's already time <laughs> to get started. <coughs> so let me first remind you that next week is your turn <laughs> to present here what have you accomplished on final projects so far, or by the end of this week, I suppose. Uh, we will have we will do it in two groups, as I already mentioned, right? Like first half of the teams will be presenting on Monday and the second half on Wednesday. Just to give you a little bit more time. You are you look surprised, you shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> do you have like a, a format for what you expect us to present? I thought yeah, it's, it's, it's really similar to last year thing. Oh yeah, that's that's a very good question. Did I not show you some examples from last year? <laughs> Maybe not. So the, the, the format is uh, you want to do like a little bit of presentation saying what did you do, but, do, but not spend like too much time discussing any details or anything like that. What you really want to show at this point especially is to show, show the result. <laughs> what have you accomplished so far? So it can be, you can, basically you can really do whatever you want that works the best for your particular project always some sort of blend of explaining what did you act actually do, what paper did you implement, what techniques did you come up with, what, what problems did you encounter, and mixed with some results, showing something, what does it actually do, <laughs> what, what the results are, what, what, what came out of your simulations. Okay. It's, uh, you can, uh, some people do it using PowerPoint, right? That's the usual suspect. Some people prefer to just like be showing their demo and like talking over it. You can either, you can do it, you, one person can do it for the whole team or you can just switch if you want. <coughs> I think it's usually better if, if just one person does it. But yeah, if you, if, if you think you will interact nicely, then you can just ping pong there and bang. <laughs> okay, we still have Wednesday to, to discuss that. <laughs> I don't expect you to have your projects ready today, <laughs> but by the end of this week, you should have something presentable. Okay, <coughs> but if somebody has some sort of issues like we can't make it on Monday, these guys can make it on Wednesday and so on, that's, that's also why we have two slots for that. Then Lucy, one of the TAs, Yingping Zhang, she promised she will uh, take care of the scheduling. So if you have something like that, then email me and CC her and we will try to take it into account. <coughs> okay, how is the final project going by the way? Is who is doing rigid bodies? You, only you? There was, uh, there was some other, maybe they're just not here. We have, we have a small fraction <laughs> present here. It's sort of funny that we'll be, there will be many more people <laughs> the next week. They will show up. Some people I haven't seen before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what do we need to do today? Unless you have some questions on your final projects, <coughs> which I'm also happy to discuss after the class, by the way, and, on, and especially on Wednesday when during my office hours. So today we want to finish the rigid body sim. <coughs> the really the fun part of, of all that. So what I discussed so far was how to simulate a, essentially a single rigid body or multiple rigid bodies as long as they are not interacting with each other, right? Of course, if there are no forces acting between two rigid bodies, then the simulations are completely independent. Nothing special about that. <coughs> but the fun part, it starts being fun when you have lots of interacting rigid bodies, right? Like imagine angry birds. The cool thing is that you have all these rigid bodies stacked on top of each other, then, then comes the ball and breaks it apart, makes, makes it all fall apart. <laughs> and that's basically what is explained in this last part of the rigid body simulation tutorial by David Burroughs, and that's what I'll discuss today in this slide, sure. <coughs> so the non-penetration constraints. So the point is that you are simulating a bunch of rigid bodies, right, I guess I should make it explicit, I think you all understand what I mean. The point is you are simulating lots of rigid bodies and <coughs> if you don't do anything, they will just be gladly going through each other, right? We have not covered collision detection yet, so here I will just assume we have working collision detection routines. Collision detection is what I am planning to cover on Wednesday and then after your final project's presentations week, okay? <coughs> so let's uh, quickly um, recap what did we end up with. So a rigid body we represented by a state vector of four things. That was xt. You can try to think what what these were. 
PT and capital LT. It's working. Yeah, that is working. So what what these guys were? Does somebody want to remind them? Remind me. So XT. Okay, let me do it in the interest of time. XT was the uh, position of the center of mass of the rigid body. RT was the orientation of the rigid body. P, what was P? Linear momentum, and L was angular momentum. And the T is time, right? Because all these all these things vary in time. And the ODE, the Newton Lagrange, uh, no, sorry, Newton Euler equations governing the motion of a rigid body say that the time derivative of this, which we often denote just with, with the dot, is this. So the derivative of the center of mass trajectory is the velocity of the center of mass, denoted as Vt. The derivative of r, that was the funny part, right, which I spent quite a bit of time explaining, that it differentiates to this. Where the omega, what is the omega? So those are, I'm giving you easy opportunities to claim some activity, brownie points. <laughs> Omega, of course, is angular velocity. The question is in what coordinate system? Because you should never cross the streams, not cross the coordinate systems, mix up with the coordinate systems. So here the omega is in the world space coordinates because first the r converts it from object coordinates to world coordinates, and then I have this funny, yo, oh, what, what is this notation, by the way? This brackets with the vector. Omega is a three by one vector. That's an angle of velocity vector, right? And the brackets, they turn it into a three by three anti-symmetric matrix. <coughs> the, the derivative, okay, this, this you, you absolutely have to know. What is the derivative of the linear momentum? There's something funny. <laughs> The derivative of the linear momentum is the total force, but the total force is the sum of all forces acting on all the different points of the rigid body. And the derivative of the angular momentum is the total torque tau. <coughs> so this is how we are simulating a single rigid body. The velocity we compute from the linear momentum, right? That's just because the momentum is just velocity times mass. So if I want to recover the velocity, it's as simple as that. If I want to recover the angle of velocity, then that's a similar relationship, but with the inertia tensor, I. So this is the angle of momentum. This is the inertia tensor in which coordinates? Again, world space coordinates, yes. So because it changes every time, it's more convenient to express it in in the body space coordinate. This is how you go from body space coordinates to world space coordinates. You just do this change of coordinates transformation R and RT and the LT of course stays there. Okay, so I'm just like writing down the equations of motion for a single rigid body just to remind you what, what we are working with here. So this is just saying that the force is the sum of individual forces and the same thing is true for the torque. Torque is just a little bit more funny than the force because it depends on where you act with the force. So this is the point where you act and this is this is the force. This is because of the lever. So this is vector from the center of mass. So this is basically the recap what we derived last time how a single rigid body moves in time subject to some external forces and consequently torques. The forces have really like dual effect on the rigid body. They, they cause the linear motion, translation, and angular motion, rotation, they, they spin it. If we still have some time, I will show you some examples, some specific examples of forces creating just, like the simplest force is gravity force, right? Whatever, whatever body you, you put in it, it doesn't spin it, it just makes it fall down sort of intuitive, right? And the math adds, adds up beautifully. So if you still have time, I can show you some examples. But let's take a look now at the non-penetration constraints. So 
So there are really two types of non-penetration constraints. There is resting and colliding contact. So the thing you know from Angry Birds, if there are like rigid bodies stacked on top of each other, so there are like some, some pillars, there is some sort of ground, and there is some sort of some table or something like that. It's also like a rigid body. That's an example of a resting contact, right? That the rigid bodies are just like stack or stacking, stack on top of each other. And they might not be moving at all, but you still need to do something to your simulator because there are forces, the rigid bodies exert forces on, on each other. There is gravity force that's pulling everything down, but there is the ground floor, which is preventing it from, from these bodies from going below the ground. And the, the task here is to compute what exact forces are acting between the rigid bodies so they don't really start penetrating. So that's one type of non-penetration constraints. The other type, which is, which is easier, is a colliding contact, collision contact. So imagine if you have like two balls, which are two rigid bodies, which are like spheres, and they are approaching each other, like two, oh, maybe I can do like an animation, here, like, like doing like this, and then they bounce off each other, right? That's a different type of contact. Why is it different? It's different because at the time of collision here, both of the rigid bodies have some velocities, right? So here, here all the rigid bodies are static. They are not moving. They are just forces acting on it. And here, but here there there are velocities. So to resolve, so this is to resolve the colliding contact. What we need to do, we need to immediately change the velocities. That's really a collision. Something bounce of something. Versus here, here we just apply forces. So uh, this case, so let's, we, we will first talk about the, the colliding, colliding contact, collision contact, when there are rigid bodies moving and they bounce off each other. So the first problem you, you, you can point out is that an ODE solver does not really support this case because the assumption of all these Euler methods and so on is that the solution is uh, continuous and smooth. Here that's not the case because if you, have, if you have two balls colliding and bouncing off, like imagine snooker pool balls, right? The change of velocities is not continuous, right? Like right, right at this moment, the velocities point like this and like microsecond afterwards the velocities go like this right they just bounce off so that's a discontinuous change right so the OD solver does not or cannot naturally handle this but I mean what you would what you would need to do in an OD solver in theory you'd have to apply infinite force really right the thing is if you want to change velocity by applying force you need to give it some time to act right like imagine you're driving a car you step on the brakes and you have really good brakes, right? It still needs time to, to act the force, right? Because the, because the force only affects velocity differentially, so it needs some time to integrate over it so it actually stops, right? If, you, if your car already is at contact with the wall, wall and has non-zero velocity, then you can have as good brakes as, 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 as you might, but that's not gonna prevent the collision, right? The collision is going to happen and it's gonna, change the velocities pretty much discontinuously. So what, what do we need to do in simulation to support this case, the colliding contact, is to stop the ODE solver, recompute the velocities using some formulas we are gonna almost derive here, and then restart. So basically, at this point where, where you detect, so first you detect collision, right? These, these, these bodies are already touching you realize that unless you do something in the next time step, they will be penetrated, right? That, 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 that we must prevent that. And the way we prevent that is we recompute the velocities and say the OD is solver, okay, go. We just stop it, recompute the velocities and restart it, okay? For de detecting the collisions, I assume we already have a perfect collision detection routine. Uh, the one detail, one important detail is that we need to find the first time of contact, right? <clears throat> because we are simulating, so if this is our time, 
line. And this is our T0 is the pre where the previous frame was computed. And we assume at the previous frame, everything was cool. Nothing was colliding with anything. Everything, the simulation was correct at T0, right? And then we are trying to do a time step towards some new time. So the new time is gonna be T0 plus delta T. And we find that during that interval, something collided. Right, it probably it's still colliding at T0 plus delta T, but in some special cases, maybe it just only collided for like a little bit, somewhere in the, in the middle of the interval. That's still bad, right? What we need to find is the first time of collision, the TC time, where, where, where the bodies first came to touch, because that's, that's where we need to apply our impulses, that's where we need to recompute the velocities. So to find the first time of contact, if we already have a perfect collision detection routine, that's, that's sort of simple, right? I guess I can write like a little pseudocode. I guess if this is a function collided, which is, this is a, my the hypothetical perfect collision detection routine, which tells me if from time T0 do, during delta T in my simulation as I've computed it, something collided then I can just do essentially binary search. So I can say, I can do, do this. I can just run it on recursively on the entire interval. If there is a collision during in, in the entire interval, then I can just try, it's like a pseudocoded thing. Then I will try the first half of the interval, delta t half else the second half of the interval. T0 plus delta T half, delta T half. So the idea is really simple. I basically check if I have my interval here, T0, T0 plus delta T. If something has collided, I will just split this interval in half and I will look if something has collided already here if yes, then I don't have to look here because this is already invalid, right? If something has already collided here and I haven't handled it, then whatever has been simulated here does, does, does not make sense. The same way, um, if nothing has collided from T0 until T0 plus a delta T half, then I know this part of the simulation is clear no, no collisions happen there. So I can only restrict my attention to the second part of the interval. So by binary, binary search, I can like pinpoint the exact time of contact when, when the contact really happened. Sometimes the collision detection routines already tell you that when, when exactly. We'll be talking about continuous collision detection, which actually takes time into account. So let's assume for now that we found the collision time TC. So that's, that's the time when we actually need to step in and recompute and, and do some collision processing. And then restart the ODE silver. So let's take a look how to do the collision processing in the case of the bouncing contact, in the case of, of colliding contact, where we need to, to recompute the velocities of the bodies, okay? Some sort of fun calculations there. So of course there can be multiple uh, pairs of rigid bodies colliding, but I will look at just one of them. Oh, I also assume some simplifying assumptions that the bodies are polyhedrons and also that they are convex polyhedrons. As just a fancy way of saying it's a mesh, just a 3D surface mesh as you are used to. And the convexity is to make sure that all these things don't have any corner cases that would make it not work, essentially. <laughs> you can create a non-convex object by putting convex objects, constraining convex objects together. But let's, let's not worry about it yet. It would usually work, but uh, without any guarantees. So let's say this is an object A, and this is an object B. This is a center of mass of A, this is center of mass of B. And here 
is a point of collision. They, they, they were moving, 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 and they came to contact at this point. So the first thing I need, I need to know the coordinates with respect to the center of mass of body A, where this uh, collision point is on the body A, and the same for the body B. This is RB and RA, okay? So we are now in a walled space, of course, because we are interested how the, how the bodies interact together, but these are with respect to the center of mass of the bodies, okay? Now, what we will want to look at is the velocity of this point. So there is, there is really just a single point of contact, right? But we can look at it both from the point of view of body A as well as from the point of view of body B. I mean, this, this is a single point in world coordinates, but it exists both on the body A and on the body B. Right? So if we compute the velocity of that point on body A, I will call it P8 dot for velocity, that's the velocity of the, the linear velocity, the velocity of the center of mass of body A, plus the angular velocity, cross product RA, right? This is, this is the formula for velocity of a point on a rigid body, which we derived the last time. Now, of course, the same thing will be our true for body B, omega B times RB. <coughs> And the point is that even though this is this is the same point in world world, world coordinates, <laughs> uh, the velocities will be different, right? Depending whether we are looking at the point on the body A as opposed to on the body B. That's because that there is there is a collision. Imagine the two snooker balls, right? And there's one ball here, another another ball here. There is a point. This 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 atom on body A has different velocity than the atom at the same location of body B, right? That's why there is, there is a problem. That's why we need to do something. So the first thing we will need here is uh, normal, because we assume that these bodies are piecewise linear, that they are, they are polyhedrons. Then we can just uh, borrow the normal so of the face and the vertex that is colliding. So we need to only consider two cases. So if I assume we have 3D rigid bodies represented by triangle meshes, that there are two uh, cases of contact we need to consider. So like in this case, it would be vertex face contact, vertex face contact, where one, one vertex touches a face of a different object. The other case, which we still need to consider, is edge-edge contact. So that's because not, not always the bodies have to collide face vertex, right? There is also a case when two edges of an object can, can meet. Now there are also other singular cases where, like for example, vertex-vertex or vertex-edge, but those you don't have to uh, consider separately because these, these cases, you uh, catch them already. And they are also like inf infinitely improbable, right? That you would just be so lucky that it is exactly hit vertex with a vertex. And there are always some numerical tolerances, right? Because the com computations are never really exact. So you always need to have some sort of epsilon so around it, which, which makes it never the case that vertex would perfectly hit a vertex anyway. So in the case we have the vertex phase contact like here, then the normal, the separating plane normal, so the two bodies because they are convex, directs is a separating plane between them. So the, and the normal of the separating plane is just equivalent to the normal of the phase in this case. Now if we have an edge edge contact, we can compute also a normal. Of course it cannot be just normal of the phase, but instead we can do this, or the normal will be the one edge cross product the other edge. So we just cross product the edges and we also get a good separating plane. So in either, either case, we have the separating plane and the normal of the separating plane. And now the important thing we need to look at is the relative velocity at the point of contact projected on this normal of the separating plane. So 
This is the formula for the relative velocity at the point of contact. This is a dot product. I think this is like a third convention, third notation for dot product I'm using in this course, and it's because I want to stick with the notation in the course notes, so you can compare it directly with the formulas from the course notes. Again, it's just a 3D vector. Oh, I'm not doing this. I'm not playing the arrows game here because there'll be a lot of arrows. The n is the normal. It's just three by one vector, and those are also just vectors, and this means dot product. So the relative velocity is one as a type. It's a scalar, right? It's the dot product of two three-dimensional vectors. And this relative velocity, so what it is, I take the velocity of the point on body A, so it's sort of difficult to show, it's, it's this point on body A minus the velocity of the same point on body B, or different point, whatever, whatever you wanna look at it, dot product with the normal. So the component of the relative velocity, or the other way you can look at it, is the velocity of this point of object A as viewed from an observer on object B. So let's, we, we can, without loss of generality, we can assume that we are like studying the situation from the point of view of, of the body B, and we're looking at the relative velocity. So the component of the relative velocity in the direction of this, of the normal N. And there are three, three cases that can happen. So if the VREL, if the relative velocity is positive, and what does that mean? So let me sketch the situation here. We have our normal here. And we have the PA dot minus PB would be something like this. So that means after projecting it on the normal, we get a positive number. So what does that mean? What does that tell us? So, so this is my body B, this is my body A. I'm just like, I'm just like focusing on this, this, this small piece, it's like zoom onto that. So the relative velocity is positive, is that good or bad? <laughs> yes, they are separating, so. In the, in the sense you are worried about collision processing, then that this is good <laughs> because that means you don't have to do anything, right? This means the bodies are separating already. Separating. For for some reason they happen to touch, but like then wind blows or something like that and the bodies already go away without us having to do anything. So this is fine because that means we can let it simulate as it wants and there will be no contacts. So this is okay. Non-penetration non constraints are satisfied. Fine. All right. So what if VRL is zero? What does that mean? So if I have this, this drawing and VRL is zero, that means that object A slides <laughs> over object B, right? So this, this turns out to be the case of the resting contact. Where velocities, as far as velocities is concerned, everything is fine. This is sort of like the rest of the Angry Birds sort of, sort of example. Because this relative velocity can also be zero, right? That's the special case when it's actually not moving. It is, it is in contact. The relative velocity, of course, will be zero. What we need to do in this case is to make sure that all the forces add up, that there are no forces that would be generating acceleration of the bodies towards each other, right? It's like, I guess, the car analogy, like if you are parking next to a wall, you wanna make sure you, you put the right direction forward or backward, you don't wanna be accelerating towards the wall. So that's, that's, that's the resting contact, and that's what I will discuss after we are done with the colliding contact. So that's the more complicated case where we need to go to second order differentiation to forces and compute how the forces work. As far as velocities are concerned, we are fine, right? Because this, you can time step it forward and there will be no penetrations. Now the penetrations would develop later in case there is acceleration going, but we'll worry, worry about it later. 
Now the final case, and that's where we actually will have to do something, is this. And you can already yell at me what it actually means. Well, that means the velocity goes like this, right? If this is my normal. Oops, it's not very normal. Here is my normal. And that means that the unless we do something, the bodies will immediately interpenetrate, right? So the interpenetration is imminent. And as I, as I, as I explained, it's too late to be applying forces at this point. <laughs> at this point, this is, this is really the case of the two snooker balls colliding. So what happens there, and I think that's studied quite a bit in physics, is like physics of collisions. And I think he, here we are just assuming the super simplest possible case of like frictionless and, and, and so on. But what we need to do here since forces won't save us, is to apply an impulse. That's the way how you can sort of wrap your head around infinite forces. Because if you have infinite forces applied over zero time, sort of integrates to something finite. And that something finite is the impulse. It's just like a fancy ways of saying, well, let's just modify the velocities. But, but mathematically, you can give it some sort of nice framework. It's similar to the delta function, right? Do you, do you know the delta function, which is like zero everywhere except for zero, where it's some sort of funny value such that the integral of the delta function is one, right? So it's zero everywhere except for one point. So it's like infinite something applied over a zero period, which integrates to something finite. So that's the idea of impulse. And that's exactly what we need to apply here to resolve, to, to prevent the imminent penetration, interpenetration. So what is impulse? Impulse is denoted as J, and it means immediate change of momenta. I'm saying momenta because both the linear and angular momentum, momenta are affected. So I will not find the momentum. So how does the impulse work exactly? So the impulse immediately changes. So the P was a linear momentum. So if this was my previous linear momentum, then the new linear momentum will be P plus J. So the impulse also has units of momentum. So what does it mean for velocity? Because there is a direct linear relationship between uh, linear momentum and velocity. That means that the new velocity will be simply P nu divided by the total mass of my body, which was the, if I just plug back this in, and I will see that this is that. This is, this is all very simple plus J divided by M, which I can say this is some delta B. This is again, velo again, again velocity. So basically applying the impulse, adding it to the linear momentum. We said that the state of the rigid body doesn't really have the velocities explicitly, right? But instead has the linear and angular momenta in it. That's why we want to update the linear and angular momentum. I'll show the angular in a second. But it directly corresponds to changing the velocity. Sort of makes sense, right? If just, just like I drew here, and you have the two snooker balls colliding, here I need to recompute the velocities. And the impulse is, is the tool for that. Now, uh, the impulse also generally generates, generates torque, which is sometimes called the impulsive torque. So the impulsive torque needs to take into account where in respect to the center of mass we have applied this impulse capital J. And this impulsive torque then has the same effect of an, on angular momentum as the regular impulse has on linear momentum. That means we take the old angle momentum and add the impulsive torque. So we can again di directly compute what does it mean for angular velocity. So the new angle velocity, it's the inertia curve tensor, which is just this. 
and this is simply the old angle velocity and this is a change in angle velocity so again the same the same idea both the linear and angle velocities they just change instantaneously you can also think about it sort of like a position based dynamics does position based updates you are here you are doing essentially like immediate updates of the velocities just recompute the velocities so this is all cool uh, and what we need to know though is what how to compute this capital J right what impulse to apply in a collision okay the good news is that the direction of the imp so the impulse is a vector, right? The 3D vector. And the direction of the vector is uh, specified by our normal, right? This, this, is, this, is, this is the normal, which I discussed. In this case of vertex phase contact, simply the normal of the phase. If it's edge-edge contact, then the normal is the cross product of the edges. So I assume that the normal is normal, then it's length one. And the only thing that remains to determine is the lowercase j. The lowercase j is the magnitude of the impulse. Now, uh, due to action, the, due to law of action and reaction, the body A will receive receives plus j, and body B receives impulse minus j that's just that's due to newton's law right if i apply for this law of action and reaction so the what i need to do is to compute just the lowercase j what is the magnitude of the impulse i need to apply to a particular collision So to compute this, I will need some sort of law for a bounce, some sort of model of bounciness of the two rigid bodies contacting. Because like imagine if the two rigid bodies uh, bouncing off each other are rubber balls, super balls. You know what is a super ball? This, this, this little ball that bounces like a lot. <laughs> How do you call that? Super ball? Yeah. Good. That's what I played it when I was little. Uh, that's, that's, that's something that <laughs> bounces really, really well. <laughs> and that will have very different, uh, um, that will have a very different magnitude of the impulse than, than for example, than if something mushy collides, right? Like imagine the, the two balls I made, I don't know from what, from like hay or something, something really mushy or cloth right they certainly won't bounce bounce off each other that much so the way we can model this and again this is the, the the most simple model for collisions you can imagine is using a restitution coefficient usually denoted as epsilon so epsilon equal one will correspond to our super ball perfectly bouncy collision no kinetic energy is lost it's just just the velocities change direction and epsilon equal to zero means no bounce at all completely damped collision completely mushy sort of thing so if you imagine like snooker balls are not not that ideal but basically they come like this then they just stop this is this this basically compensates for the fact that no body in nature is really rigid right there's always some sort of deformation going on bigger or smaller and if there if there, if there is a lot then all of the uh, kinetic energy in the collision can be absorbed in, in, in and damped inside inside the body right like if you have two cloth balls or something that doesn't really bounce all that much that's very low coefficient of restitution. Okay, and now we need to uh, consider the velocities before applying the impulse and after applying the impulse. So I will give it a signs of minus for pre-collision quantities 
and sign of plus for post collision quantities. So PA dot minus minus PB dot minus. So this is a pre collision relative velocity. And I can also have post post collision relative velocity. So that means post collision means after applying the impulse. So this is before impulse, before contact, before collision, and this is after. Okay. And the way we compute the J, that, that's the only thing we need to compute here because we already know the normal. The law for frictionless collisions says that the relative, uh, relative velocity after applying the impulse should be minus epsilon times the relative velocity before applying the impulse. Okay, so in this case, there was some relative, there was some pretty high relative velocity. The relative velocity flips. It goes, if they bounce, they go the other way. And the epsilon tells me how much of the velocity essentially was absorbed in the collision. So if the, if the epsilon is zero, you can see that the relative velocity after the collision will be zero, right? It will essentially come back to, to this case. It will, it will immediately transfer to resting contact. It will just stop there. And if the epsilon is, is bigger, closer to one, then it's close to like perfect bounds that the velocity has just flipped their orientation, okay? And from this, we can uh, compute J. I will just show you sort of quickly how the computations work. It's not very complicated, it's just like a lot of algebra in it. So what you need to do to derive that is to realize that the PA, the post-collision velocities, the post-collision velocity of the point consists of the post-collision velocity of the center of mass plus the post-collision angle velocity and here you can plug in the impulse magnitude. So this is the pre-collision linear velocity plus Jn divided by the mass of body A, right? And this guy here is, just as we said before, that's the update for the angle velocity. So it's the pre-collision angle velocity plus the inertia tensor. Now we need to put there where, where the impulse is actually acting. <clears throat> now we would do the same thing for PB. Then we would substitute this here. And from this, and, and then, then plug it into this formula. And this would allow us to compute J with respect to epsilon. So I'm not gonna do that because I would kill the rest of the lecture with that. I'm just going to show you uh, how is it? How is the result here in the course notes? <coughs> so those are those are the equations I was talking about. Visible. So basically, you you plug it all together. You do. There is really no. The reason I'm not doing it is there are no uh, interesting ideas in there. It's really just basic algebra, and eventually you'll come up with a horrible looking but quite simple formula how to compute the j <coughs> so again it's yeah I, I implemented it once long time ago and it's just horrible looking formula but it, there is nothing special really about this right all the, all these things you already have available those are the masses this is the normals this is the inverse um, inertia tensor this is where the collision happened and the only thing that is a parameter here is this epsilon that's the coefficient of restitution a bunch of cross products and you, you, you get your j from the j oh there is also a pseudocode by the way which sort of if you are implementing this would make your life easier and once you have computed the j the lowercase j then you know what is the uppercase j because the j is just the vector version that's in the direction of the normal and you, you apply the impulse, basically you just use the post-collision velocities, this VA plus and omega A plus, those are the new velocities 
or for both both objects A and B, and then you restart your ODE solver, and everything happily bounces around. Oh yeah, there is one trick I wanted to mention. If you have something that's supposed to be like a wall or like a ground, some rigid object that's not supposed to move, then you can notice that here we, in this formula, we only need inverse masses and inverse inertia tensors. So you can do the same trick as I think I mentioned before in like the context of PVD or something like that. You can, if you have something that's not supposed to move, then you can just say that the inverse mass or and the inverse inertia tensor are zero. That corresponds to infinite mass and infinite inertia tensor, but you never really need to store the original one, you only need to store the inverse one, so you can just put their zeros. And that makes sure that if if you collide with the static obstacle, be it a ground or a wall or something, that the static obstacle is not going to go anywhere. Okay, so this was for the colliding contact, and we still have to uh, discuss a little bit the resting contact. It's also very interesting. How to deal with the stacking problem. Let's take a look at that. So resting contact. So on the di diagrams I was drawing before, this corresponds to this situation, right? The relative velocity has zero component in the normal. This is still my normal in the, in the normal direction. This was body A, this is body B. That also means that the velocity can easily be zero, that the bodies can be just resting on each other. So the complication here is that we can have an entire stack of rigid bodies. So let me show you, just like in Angry Birds, or name your favorite game. You can have this like funny situation like this. And for some reason, this is stable, right? Those are, those are rigid bodies. Those are contact points. Each of the contact points has some normal. So this is, this is some sort of ground plane, some big rigid body, which is, which is not moving, static, static obstacle. So there are um, normals at each of the contact points. And if this is uh, stable, we need to compute the contact forces there, right? Such that after we actually run the simulation, the, the, the structure remains where it is. Uh, the bodies not, don't, don't start penetrating. They don't accelerate towards each other because they can't, they are rigid, right? So we need to compute the appropriate contact forces that actually really prevent them to accelerate through each other as they would in the real world. Now this means that we need to take the previous analysis like one order of differentiation higher. We cannot be looking just at the velocities because looking just at the velocities doesn't cut it, right? The relative velocity there is already zero. So as far as velocities are concerned, there's nothing, no interpenetration is happening. Now the problem is that when forces, when accelerations are concerned, then there will be immediate uh, interpenetration happening. So we need to be a little more uh, careful in this analysis. And let's let's again take a look just at two rigid bodies. Let's just let's just look at every contact point for a moment individually. Then we will of course have to put them all together and do a global solve because as you can probably imagine the force here influences everything, right? If 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 you remove one one <laughs> one card from the house of cards everything falls, of course. But let's take a look at them first individually. So, um let me let me draw it like this. So what we need to do is to or we do like this. We need to basically consider a small interval of time 
just before and just after the collision because I will need to differentiate this relative velocities so I can be looking ju just at velocities at this time of contact TC but I need to be looking also at the velocities a little bit before and a little bit after so I can differentiate them to accelerations so let's say that this point is called QA and the corresponding point where, where it's going to contact at time TC is called QB before the time of contact they are of course not not touching but at the time of contact they would be so QAT would be the trajectories or you put it here QAT and QBT are the world space contact point trajectories and similarly to before, what we did before we will have to look at the separation distance so we, we, all, we still have the normal right that's the same story as before so the separation distance is still defined as the dot product of the normal times QAT minus QBT. So this, this quantity D is my separation distance. That means if the DT is greater than zero, that means that they are, they are safe. If, they, if DT is below zero, that means that there is already penetration. That means something went wrong. That could mean like there is a bug or something. So what, do we, what we need to compute, we need to differentiate this D twice. So differentiating it for the first time, so this is dot product, right? This is a 3D vector, this is another 3D vector. So this means differentiating the N and just copying this, this term plus not differentiating n and differentiating the other term. So now we have the separation velocity. And if we, if we compute the separation velocity at the time of contact, d, t, c, then we know that q, a, t, c, that that's my time of contact, QATC must be equal to QBTC because there is a contact. The world space coordinates of the two points are the same, right? <clears throat> if that wasn't the case, I would be processing the collisions to begin with. So at this time, the DTC reduces to just the same, this, this, this falls out because that will be zero and reduces to just this, this part, QA dot TC minus qb dot tc this is exactly the relative velocity i used in the discussion before and right, where was my relative velocity here i was denoting just as pa and pb and they were evaluated exactly at the time of contact because in the previous discussion i was not concerned about the the neighborhood of the time of contact, just about the time of contact itself. So this, the first derivative of D at the time of contact, that's exactly my relative velocity. So that also means that if the, ver if the relative velocity is not zero, then I'm back to the previous case, right? That's my colliding contact case. So that means that here I can assume that the relative velocity really is zero. Because otherwise, otherwise it's the previous case. Otherwise it's this or this case. In this case I have to do nothing. In this case I recompute the velocities as, as we just discussed. So let's assume that the relative velocity is zero. That means that the D at TC is zero and of course the d the, the derivative of d at tc is zero and of course the d at tc is also zero because the the things are just touching right there is there is no separation distance and there is no penetration 
perfect, perfect contact. What do we need to do now is to differentiate this again. It's not so bad. So we need to compute what is the second derivative of t at time of contact. Tell me, help me if I put it. So it would be wrong to start from this. Oh, it would be even wrong to put her the TC. Let me take the, the C back. Because that's, that, that's why I needed this full formula to begin with, because I need to know how, how it behaves around the TC so I can act, actually differentiate it, right? So forget about the time of contact and just, just differentiate it. So that means that I have to, so this is, this is the first term, this is the second term. So differentiating the first term gives me second derivative of the normal at QAT minus QBT plus, yes, 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 you do. The first derivative of the normal times derivative of Q A T minus Q B T. Now here comes the second term. So here I do the derivative of the normal times. These these are all dot products. Okay, maybe I need to give it another little dot to make sure it's a dot product. Q A dot T minus Q B dot T. Plus, now I don't differentiate this and differentiate the second thing. So this is gonna be double derivative of QA minus double derivative of QB. Okay. <coughs> Did I do it right? Yes. So one thing you can notice is that this thing and this thing are the same. So I can simplify it a little bit like this. QAT minus QBT <coughs> plus two, okay, I'm really forgetting the products, sorry about that. QAT minus QBT plus N dot the second derivative. T. Okay. And what this is, this is the separation acceleration. So if the D was sep separation distance, the D was separation distance, the first derivative was separation velocity. The second derivative is the separation acceleration. Okay. <clears throat> now we can do a little bit of simplification if we now look at what is the d uh, at the time of contact. Then we know that this is zero. So this first term falls out, right? Maybe I can just put it like this. So at T equals TC, this is zero. Okay. And clearly, guess what, what, guess what do we want? We want to make sure that at the time of contact, the separation acceleration is always non-negative, right? So in the previous, in the colliding case, we made sure that the separation velocity will not make the bodies go through. Here we need to make sure that the accelerations will also not make the bodies to go through each other. Okay. So this was only for looking at one contact and we, need, we will need to look at all of them together because they are all coupled together. So let me give this an index i which indexes the contact. So this is one contact, another contact, another contact, and so on. So I'll just index them with i, and assume we have done this calculation for every contact 
contact point for eighth pair of rigid bodies. And what do we need to do now is to, to prevent, uh, to, to, or to satisfy this constraint, we need to apply forces, which will denote as capital FI, apply contact forces, which will make sure that the separation acceleration at all contact points will be non-negative. That's what we need to. That's what we need to do. Now, these forces, the contact forces, their directions are again given by the normals, right? Like, like, like sketched here. If if it's a, a vertex and face case, then the normals are just copy normals of the faces. If it was an edge edge case, it would be a cross product of the edges. So, what do we need to compute here? Are the magnitudes of the forces? Just like previously, we had to compute the magnitudes of the impulses. Here, we need to compute the magnitudes of the forces. Uh, there is an important constraint for the forces because the forces also must not be negative, right? If, if these, if the contact forces were allowed to be negative, that would that would be that would essentially mean the bodies are like magnets, right? They're just like sticking together by themselves, right? The contact forces can on, only be pushing them apart. It cannot, they cannot be sticking them together unless you really wanted to simulate magnets, but then you wouldn't be doing this, right? So we have, we can, we can summarize our constraint. This is constraint number one, that the separation accelerations should not be negative. Number two is that all the contact forces must be also non-negative. And there is a third interesting constraint, which means which says that if the bodies are already separating, so that means if the separation acceleration is already greater than zero, then the contact force must be zero there. Because imagine if the bodies are in contact and something happens, maybe like a wind blows or like the, the, the user pushes, pushes on the object, such that the objects already are separating by themselves, then we must not apply there any contact forces, right? The contact forces only are active if the bodies are pushing on each other. If they are not, then the contact forces must be turned off, must be set to zero. So that's the third constraint here. And we can equivalently express it in a, in a funny way. We can equivalently say that, the, that Fi times Di at the time of contact, maybe I'll just discard discard this, maybe I'll just say Fi di is zero. Why this is equivalent? I just, uh, here, here I just discarded the TC because I just assumed we are at the time of contact. This, oh, this, this should have been TC too, sorry. So why this is equivalent? Well, what, what does this mean? What does this mean? So first of all, the DIs, they can only be zero or great or something greater than zero, right? So this means that if the DI separation acceleration is greater than zero, then it says exactly this, right? So if the di is greater than zero, then this, this condition says then fi must be zero. That's exactly what this says, right? And if the di already is zero, then the fi can be whatever. So that really is equivalent. That's just like a funny way of reformulating this implication, right? This is, this is like an implication. If this is true, then this. If this is not true, then whatever, then I don't care, okay? So this gives us, so if we, if we put it in this form, this gives us a three sets of constraints. And there is one important thing, that there is a linear relationship between the force magnitudes, Fi's, and the, con and the separation acceleration, Di's. It turns out, again, I'm not gonna derive that because uh, that's also tricky, but it is true that there are some just constants A. Uh, 
such that the separation acceleration linearly depends on the magnitudes of the contact forces. And these A's are just uh, constants you can compute. So in matrix form, you can write this like this, D1, to if, if I have N contact points, this is some matrix, which is constant. Here are my contact forces, Fn. And here is some vector of right-hand sides. That's, again, just, just a constant. Doesn't really matter. So I can denote this as <coughs> a vector, D double dot. This is a vector F. This is a vector B. And this leads to what is known as linear complementarity problem. Because now in this um, succinct matrix notation, I can just write it like this. I am looking for D's non-negative, D double dots non-negative, F non-negative, such that this system is satisfied is true so this is what's called the linear complementary problem LCP and that's what you need to solve to solve for the contact forces now the linear complementary problem it can be converted to QP to quadratic programming problem but usually uh, I don't know if I can say usually but all of the physics engines, they have some sort of way to solve, typically have some sort of way to solve LCP to determine the contact forces. Oh, sorry. You can also use a quadra you can also use a regular quadratic programming solver. I think that the point is that there is usually not so many contact points. So this, uh, even though it's sort of like a sophisticated numerical optimization thing, it can be done quickly because you don't have that many yeah, degrees of freedom there, unless you really have like lots of stack bodies. In that case, you need to be probably very careful about this solver. But it, that's already on, on the boundary of, 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 of what I know. I have never really implemented this, even though it could be a really cool thing to, to try. Okay. So we still have a little bit of time, so I can give you a few basic examples something more down to earth. I think there is still quite a long way to turn this into working implementation. There's lots of lots of tricks and you have to be very careful in the programming. That's why there are these rigid body um, engines to begin with, right? If it was something very easy to do, then you wouldn't bother bother, bother with some ex external libraries. <laughs> but but the principle is, is really this, computing, in this case of the resting contact, computing the contact forces, in the case of collisions, just computing the post-collision velocities. That's, that's the idea. That's what I wanted you to remember. Okay, I don't have a whole lot of time, but I can show you just a few basic examples about rigid bodies, unless you already had it in some physics class, which there is usually studied in, in more detail. So I can define I can show what is inertia tensor for a box with some coordinate system. So this is a rest pose of a box. This is, this is something fairly simple. I put the center of my coordinate system in the center of mass of the box because that's what we said is a, is a good thing. And the box goes from minus x zero half. The box is essentially just the Cartesian product of these three intervals, right? So if the box has a density one, what would be the mass of that box? The total mass is the integral of density, right? Which I said is one, why, why, why complicate things? Which means the integral from minus x zero half to x zero half, minus y zero half to y zero half, same thing for z of one d z d y d x which is how much 
Yep, x x is zero, y zero, z zero, right? Those are those are so this is this would be the x zero length, this would be the y zero and the, nothing special really. Now what is what is good about the integral is that we can use the same thing to compute the inertia tensor. So for example so the inertia tensor, let me remind you that it consists of these components i x x, i x y, i oops, i x z, i x y it's symmetric, right? I y y and so on. And for example, the i x x can be computed like this. So it's the integral over the same domain over the over the box. And here I would have the density, which is one. And the interesting part here is the i y squared plus z squared dz dy dx. And if you like computing integrals, you can just compute this you should you should all know how to do that and what you will get at the end of the day I'm not I'm not really gonna do it I don't have the time for that but I will write the result and this is this this is the result so the m this is the total mass of the box and this turns out to be m divided by 12 due to integration things like this you also find if you compute the integral for the xy's and and so on so that would be an integral of x times y so that would be from x times y dz dy dx we'll find out that, that this is just zero so the inertia tensor of the box is m12 times this y0 squared plus z0 squared 0 0 Zero, zero squared plus z zero squared, zero squared plus y zero squared. <coughs> now the eigenvectors of this matrix are important because they are the principal axes of inertia. The, in this case, the eigenvectors are trivial, right? What are the eigenvectors of this matrix? Just, just the standard basis vectors, right? X, x axis, y axis, and z axis. Those are the eigenvectors, of course, of this matrix. <coughs> Which means that these axes are the stable axes of rotation. If you, if you spin it <coughs> around that axis, it will just keep spinning around that axis. So there'll be no funny precession business or anything like that. I, I told you before that if there are no external forces acting on it, the the instant, uh, instantaneous axis of rotation can still be changing. There are these funny precession motions, but not if you are rotating about a stable axis of rotation. And now uh, let's let's take a look at what what happens if we are acting with forces on this box. So let's assume. Okay, I'll do it again to make it a little bit neater. Let's assume I have two forces acting on two points on the box, force F1 and force F2. And let's say this is acting on point P1 with respect to the center of mass. This is acting on point P2. So let's say the point P1 is this, what is P1? Minus three, zero, minus two. And P2 would be three, zero, minus two. So this is this is this the same coordinate system. So this is x, this is y, this is z. Does it? Yeah. So this is like minus three in x, zero at y. So it's in the middle of the box, and minus two in z. Okay. So that that makes sense. So in the first case, let's assume that f1 is the same as f2. And they are both just one in the z direction. So what what that should be? What what motion of the box should that induce? Just pushing on two points of the box, right? If it's this box with this inertia tensor and this mass, which doesn't really matter so much here. <laughs> 
So the total force is the sum of the two forces, right? Which is just zero, zero, two. So that will be the, the force pushing the box. And what is the torque? That's the sum. The torque is the sum of the cross product of the first point cross F1 plus the second point cross F2. And in this case, it turns out that this is completely zero because you can just well, no, you, you really have to compute it. I don't have time to compute it. You can compute it and what you will get is zero. So in, the, in this case, this force pair, because the fo both forces are acting in the same direction, will induce no rotation of the box. Now, if, if, if I do it differently, let's assume that I keep F1 as it was. I say F1 is still zero, zero, 001 and F2 will be zero, zero, minus 1. Guess what happens then? Exactly, there will be zero. If I sum them, there is a zero force. So there is, there is zero translational effect of the force, but I will get a torque. So after computation, I will get a torque, which is zero, six, zero. And the total force will be zero, zero, zero. So this force pair purely rotates the box versus this force pair purely translate the box. Okay, so that's about all I wanted to tell you on rigid bodies. Do you have any questions? So on Wednesday we will follow up with collision detection to cover the last <laughs> important piece. And I wish you good luck with your final projects. <laughs> all right.